Um, I'm Philip Marshall, the current chairman of the Family Law Bar Association, and uh, I'm very pleased to have been invited to moderate. My part in this uh, session is is quite uh, limited, but I've been asked to come and moderate um, arbitration in children cases uh, arranged uh, by the Bar Council and by uh, Anthony Kirk, Queen's Council, who's sitting on the front row. Uh, arbitration is, of course, something with which you will all be well familiar, and I imagine, because you're in this room, um, have some for which you have some enthusiasm. The financial uh, arbitration scheme set up by IFLA um, has been a success. It's growing in popularity, and there is now, with the advent of the children arbitration scheme, every reasonable expectation that arbitration will take off as a real alternative uh, why one might ask uh, would one choose to arbitrate the children but to litigate the money and vice versa. And um, uh, the new scheme, which is of course now um, attracting uh, ever more um, qualified arbitrators, uh, is really a bright light, I think, in terms of the way forward. Now, we're very fortunate uh, this evening to have uh, an expert panel of both arbitration trainers and arbitrators, of course, all in their own right, uh, and I'll be introducing them to you. Most, uh, of course, will be all familiar with who they are uh, during the course of the evening. But first of all, we're going to hear from Sir James Mumbay, who, the pres who is, of course, the president of the Family Division and needs no introduction at all from me. Sir James has been entirely forward and far-sighted in his approach, if I may say so, to the finance arbitration scheme. He's given a number of important judgments in relation to that and what um, those who choose to arbitrate can expect from the courts if they go through the process. And he is going to start us off with some general observations uh, as to what it's about, is it likely to succeed, uh, and uh, will it take off. So, Sir James, if I may, thank you. He gives me more credit than is due to me. Uh, I mean, very prescient voices many years ago were preaching the need in the family justice system for ADRs, it used to be called, um, and arbitration in particular. Um, distinguished proponents of those ideas where I think I'm right in saying a young Mr. Peter Singer, Queen's Counsel, which shows just how long ago these ideas were first circulating, uh, and more recently Sir Matthew Thorpe. Um, they have both lived to see the coming to fruition of the ideas which they were first, when they were first peddling them, where I suspect the views of voices are crying in the wilderness. Why arbitrate in children's cases? Well, I'd like to put the point slightly more generally. One of the least recognized and least utilized provisions in the family proceedings rules, and it is right up front is that every judge at every hearing must take appropriate steps, I paraphrase, to see whether a case is not capable of solution by some non-court dispute resolution technique. Um, I have to confess to my shame, I've never implemented that rule myself. Uh, I've never heard it implemented. I suspect it's one of the least implemented provisions in the family proceedings rules, but it is there and it sends a very clear message um, I'm going to be slightly ambivalent tonight. The emphasis tonight, of course, is on arbitration. My emphasis is on what we now call non-court dispute resolution. I've always been indiscriminate in my support of all such schemes because I strongly believe that um, mediation may be the right solution in one kind of case, arbitration in another, collaborative law in another, medarb in another, and so on and so forth. They're all important techniques. What none, I believe, has a monopoly uh, on uh, of being the, the thing in every case, but they're all very important. And certainly arbitration is at least as important as everything else. I think it's a very great pity, and I've said this repeatedly, that the government, when it chose to legislate, uh, put its shirt on one form of a, 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 um, ADR, namely mediation. We need all forms of non-court uh, dis dispute resolution. Arbitration is very important. Why arbitrate in children cases? Well, we need to arbitrate wherever appropriate across the entire family justice system. We are, after all, toying, uh, even in the public law context, with things like settlement conferences, which are not arbitration, but they're inching in that direction. 
So far as concerns children, well, two very simple points, if I may. Uh, first of all, Section 1.5 of the Children Act, if I've got the number right, uh, enshrines the no-order principle, which is a statutory encouragement to people to resolve their own problems, uh, and surely consistently with that, resolving their own problems with the support of such professional input as may be appropriate. Uh, secondly, Mr Justice Baker, as I recall, two, three, four years ago, whatever it was, in effect upheld a prospective arbitration in a children uh, case. The heavens did not fall in. It all went very smoothly. Uh, and so here we are today. Now, you will appreciate I've got to be careful in what I said. I can guess so far because if the precedent of arbitration in money cases anything to go by, sooner or later, and I suspect sooner rather than later, some case will be put in front of me, seeking, no doubt, uh, from those who put the case before me, the same kind of judicial, dare I say, enthusiastic judicial support for arbitration as I find myself able to utter in the great case of S and S. But you don't have to be particularly intelligent, and you're all highly intelligent people, you hardly have to read between the lines of what I said in S and S to be able to predict fairly accurately what my view is likely to be, what the view of my brethren is likely to be uh, when the early children arbitration cases come to court. Um, if, of course, you want a more sophisticated way of predicting the outcome, then if you read your newspapers on, was it Monday or was it Tuesday this week, uh, there were astonishing reports of some algorithm which some clever person has devised which predicts with a 79 percent prospect of success what the Strasbourg court is going to do before it's done it. Um, some even more insightful person commented this morning why should we assume that it's only 79 percent accurate perhaps the more appropriate understanding of the figure is that it's 100 percent accurate and the judges are only 79 percent competent <laughs> but uh, uh, there we are. Uh, you don't need an algorithm or a computer, I suspect, to predict uh, what I believe will be overwhelmingly obvious, uh, the judicial support for the scheme. There is, of course, this difference. In practical terms, you have to come to court to get your arbitral award uh, rubber stamped, so I didn't say that, I didn't say that, um, by a judge uh, in a money case, because without the judicial imprimatur, as you know, uh, you don't have an effective order. That is not so in a children case, so that many children arbitrations, I suspect, will go on as far as the courts are concerned, very much under the radar, but that is as it should be. Uh, what are the benefits of arbitration? Well, I don't have to tell you. You know what they are. Um, it was always said back in the 30s, uh, the man, there was a man outside the RCJ who walked up and down with a placard saying, don't litigate, arbitrate, and he was the greatest friend the lawyers ever had because all the arbitrations went wrong and they came to court and turned into heavy litigation. Well, that's not so now. Um, one of the benefits, of course, the benefits are speed. The benefits are overall cheapness because even if you have to pay the arbitrator, uh, the reality is litigation is like a taxi. The meter keeps on running even if it's stopped at the traffic lights, uh, and the money you save on uh, having a short process, which come to conclude, comes to a conclusion with a matter of days or weeks rather than months or years, uh, more than pays for the extra costs you incur. So it is cheaper, you have guaranteed privacy, and as Mr. Justice Holman rather ferociously pointed out in a well known money case a couple of years. It also enables you, if you want to litigate at absurd expense with a thousand leverage files uh, and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages of documents, you have the privilege of doing that by arbitration, whereas the judges, of course, won't put up with it. But being serious, there are all sorts of obvious reasons uh, why arbitration is uh, overall of benefit to people. And one very important point is that um, you don't have to arbitrate the whole thing. I mean, often you get to cases where the parties between themselves can agree everything except for one little bit. Um, and if there's that one little bit, then arbitration is a way of solving that one little bit. So the benefits are obvious. Uh, after I'd listened at, on Monday 
to a somewhat uh, complacent speech by a very senior civil servant at, uh, from the Ministry of Justice at a conference in Birmingham, whose speech was a masterpiece of Sir Humphrey. It sounded wonderful. It went on for half an hour. It seemed to say a lot. If you listen carefully, it said absolutely nothing at all. But it had given a somewhat complacent view uh, to the effect that uh, the English legal system is the best in the world and the judges in England are the best in the world. Uh, I rather deflatingly said I was prepared to accept that we were the equal of anybody in the world. I would vigorously assert that the family judge and the family justice system is as good as any part of the English justice system. But I said, and this is the point of the anecdote, anybody who asserted that our private law system was the best in the world was living in a fool's paradise. The fact is our private law system is largely still today in a state uh, of uh, not fit for purpose. Cases take far too long. Although I say it myself, I'm afraid the bitter reality is that whatever level you are in the private law system, uh, the defects in the system, which I identified in a famous judgment, uh, I say it was famous because you created stir at the time, which serendipitously I delivered on the 1st of April 2004, and which many people thought was not a real judgment with an April Fool. Many of the problems I identified there are still with us. Many of the solutions I identified have not yet been implemented. And there was a shocking case where Andrew McFarlane in the Court of Appeal a couple of years ago dealt with some private law case, which was an absolute shocker, uh, and there have been others since. So that what you are really getting, dare I suggest, if you arbitrate rather than litigate in the uh, children, the private law context, is something which is quick, something which is efficient, and in terms of the administration of justice and the quality of the arbitral tribunal is at least as good as anything you can get in the courts. So just make sure, arbitrators, that you live up to that encomium. Um, will it take off? Well, I don't have a crystal ball, uh, and by and large it's better that I don't, because most of what I would see in my crystal ball would depress me infinitely. Not so in the case of arbitration. The money arbitration took some time to take off. It was very slow in the early days, but then it suddenly took off. It got the critical mass, and the numbers started going up very radically, very drastically, dramatically. I suspect with the experience of money arbitration behind us, the take-up on children arbitration will be quicker and the acceleration will be faster. Um, I suspect that it will take off. I very much hope it takes off. Um, and uh, dare I say it, to those of you in the audience who are either barristers or solicitors or arbitrators, for goodness sake, get into this new area of work. Uh, one of my sadnesses down the years and this long predates the day when I became a judge or became uh, the president, is the great reluctance, for example, of the family bar to move into new and uh, exciting uh, areas of work. Um, one of the symbols of, uh, symbols of that is the fact that the work of the court protection has been entirely taken over by people who are not family lawyers. They saw the gap, they jumped in, don't let the same thing happen on arbitration. So there's lots and lots and lots of work out there for you, uh, whether as advocates uh, or as solicitors, uh, litigators or as arbitrators. Uh, and I very much hope that it'll take off. And insofar as I'm going to predict the future, I'm sure it will take off. Enough said. You must now listen to the experts. Next up is uh, Suzanne Kingston and Janet Baisley, Queen's Counsel. Um, both, I imagine, familiar to you all. Uh, Janet is joint head of chambers at One Garden Court and is uh, both an arbitrator and also now qualified to train uh, under the new children's scheme as an arbitrator. Um, Suzanne Kingston is um, really the spearhead for all that we now do in um, arbitration. She uh, was in at the very beginning. She was involved in setting up uh, and, and uh, partly devising the IFLA rules. Uh, she trained me, um, and her expertise is, is unrivaled within this field. They're going to talk to us uh, about, A, why should I become an arbitrator, uh, and B, something of the rules 
and the process under the new scheme. So the first question we pose is, um, should I become an arbitrator? And I think, obviously, that's a matter for you. But to encourage you, I would say that financial arbitrations are very much on the rise. We've now had 119 in this country. That may not seem that many, but frankly, I speak at conferences all over the world about arbitration, and we are seen very much as world leaders. And I think it's certainly gaining momentum and pace, as the President has indicated. Obviously, the Children's Scheme has only recently launched, and the rules, as we will describe, are in draft. Again, we need to have a critical mass of cases that are going through the Children Arbitration Scheme and we're very grateful to uh, Sir James Mumby for the President's guidance November 2015. Um, please do read that because if you're involved in an arbitration it does set out the court's views and how arbitration, how awards are made into arbitrations etc. Um, moving on to the qualifications for an arbitrator, I'm going to hone in on practising solicitors, practising barristers. Um, a 10-year post-qualification and uh, 600 hours of family law casework per annum, 400 hours in the, sp the specific area, whether that be financial or children. And you have to um, submit an application and have references, I think, from two people um, who can um, attest to your work. In relation to the competences, the Institute of Family Law Arbitrators has set out those competences as the matters which the referee has to address. Um, if you sit as a part-time judge, you only need one referee, otherwise two, but somebody like a head of chambers, a senior partner in your firm, would be perfectly acceptable as a referee. In relation to the court itself, we'd like to commend it to you. We think there are a few spaces on the next course next month. Um, there is some pre-reading. You get a pack in advance of the course. The course is over a weekend, so you have to give up a weekend, but it doesn't interfere otherwise with practice. It's a two-day course, but it's quite good fun. Um, and at the end of it, you're asked to take away a set of papers, an example case, and to, within seven days, complete and send in by email your um, award written by you in relation to the case that you're given. Assuming you pass the assignment, you will then be invited to join and become a member of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. Um, and we recommend to you that you take the training. Um, and Suzanne is now going to talk a little bit about the scheme. Yeah. So the, scheme, the children's scheme was launched on the 18th of July this year and the rules which you have effectively mirror the rules of the financial scheme apart from two very specific points which we're going to go through in detail today. That's in respect of safeguarding and the voice of the child. So basically rules 1 to 16 are pretty much the same, articles 1 to 16 are pretty much the same as the financial rules. The rules are currently in draft and they're just about to be tweaked and then will be sent out as a final version. I would urge you to keep checking on the IFLA website if you are doing an, an arbitration because the IFLA website is where the final versions of the rules or the most um, up-to-date uh, versions of the rules are kept. So looking very specifically at children arbitration, looking at Article 2.1, that sets out the scope of the scheme. So if you're ever thinking of either referring a case into arbitration or you are undertaking a case as arbitrator, barrister advocating in an arbitration, first of all check that you are within scope. So you'll see basically we're looking at any application that could be made under Section 8 of the Children Act. Um, there are limitations on scope and they are set out in Article 2.2 and there we see what is outside the scope of the um, scheme. Applications for summary return to this jurisdiction or to another jurisdiction, whether under the inherent jurisdiction of the court or under the Hague Conventions, so basically, at the moment, we can do internal relocation cases, but not external. 
I think it's fair to say that we had a very big debate about um, what we would allow to be within the scope when we were first thinking of the rules. And I think over time that may be relaxed. And I can see a situation where external relocations under the Hague Convention may be permissible. But at the moment it's just internal relocations. Uh, not in sc scope are disputes in relation to the authorisation of life-changing or life-threatening medical treatment or the progress of such treatment, any case where a party lacks capacity under the Mental Capacity Act or any case where the child concerned is a party to court proceedings. I think they're the sorts of things that you would probably expect not to be in scope. But as I say, these may change over time, so always refer to the IFLA rules. You have the form which parties use to refer their case to arbitration. It's the ARB 1CS, unglamorously called. Um, <clears throat> it speaks for itself, really. You set out your basic details and um, give various confirmations in relation to things, important things like accepting the rules of the scheme, accepting that the arbitration is binding, subject to any order the court may make, and also in relation to matters which are relevant to safeguarding. This form is currently under revision to put the um, warning notice, as it were, which currently is late on in the document at the front, um, in, in the style endorsed by the President in respect of other orders that the warning notice should be on the first page um, and it's going to add a little bit about safeguarding and understanding about safeguarding issues. Um, it provides for the appointment of the arbitrator, it provides for how the, um, what the scope of the arbitration is going to be, it refers to any ongoing court proceedings very often, arbitrators in financial cases like to have a preliminary meeting just to iron out any issues, to clarify any possible conflicts and things like that. As we're all likely to be family lawyers, that's something that's probably going to happen in the children's scheme as well. Once um, that's all been dealt with and the terms have been set out and accepted by the parties, that um, starts the arbitration off. Very importantly, the law is that of England and Wales, and the rules set out <coughs> that the welfare of the child will be paramount in a children arbitration as it is for the court, and that the arbitrator will have particular guard, regard to the Section 13 welfare checklist, and also um, to the no order principle. So I'm just going to have a quick look about the general duty of arbitrators. And this is derived from the Arbitration Act. So when we're thinking about arbitrations, we're looking first of all at the Arbitration Act 1996, with which I'm sure you're all very familiar. After that, the IFLA rules. And then after that, autonomy and agreement between the parties. So the Arbitration Act 1996, looking specifically at Section 33.1, and this is crucial because this is where arbitrators get tripped up and any challenges or appeals to arbitration, many emanate, if there are many, emanate uh, from this, uh, breaching this rule. So it's about acting fairly and impartially as between the parties, giving each party a reasonable opportunity to put their case and adopting procedures suitable to the circumstances of the particular case, avoiding unnecessary delay or expense. That's absolutely crucial and so as to provide a fair means of resolution. So I, I always say to people when we're teaching, have this by your side, uh, keep referring to it, make sure that you are adhering to section 33.1. Looking at the powers of the arbitrator, this comes from article 7.2 of the rules, and it says there specifically that the arbitrator will have the same um, powers to, as a High Court judge would, effectively, apart from a few slight tweaks, avoidance of doubt, the arbitrator's power does not extend to interim injunctions, committal, which I've always found a bit of a shame because I quite fancied the idea of committing someone to prison, but there we go, uh, or jurisdiction over non-parties. That's because obviously an arbitration agreement is uh, a bilateral agreement between the two parties, and so you could bring in third parties, but only with their agreement. Article 8 of the rules deals with case management. Mm -hmm. The arbitrator 
decides all procedural and evidential matters subject to one of the principles of, the, of arbitration that the parties can agree how they want the arbitration to proceed. But if, for example, they want their arbitration to be dealt with in a day, the arbitrator is likely to divide the day up fairly between the parties and may well limit evidence, for example, saying that uh, witnesses are to be limited, that uh, statements are to stand as evidence in chief, um, and deal with things like the appointment of experts and the extent to which the expert will um, investigate or explore the issues um, and will generally hope to achieve the aims of arbitration which is an efficient um, process that avoids delay and can be conducted with limited expense. It's possible to seek an interim determination um, that can be done if there's an interim issue, such as the usual sort of thing in private law cases, should a child go on a particular school trip, internally of course, um, should there be a holiday internally, uh, is, should, should a party be entitled to put the child in for a school um, test or something like that to enter into a particular school. Um, and in such cases, there may be need to be a reference to court if there need to be undertakings or something like that. And similarly, if the arbitrator makes an order, as the arbitrator may do in regarding disclosure or anything else, and that's not complied with, either the other party or the arbitrator can refer it to the court, and the Act provides for that. So just moving on to hearing the voice of the child, again this was something that in the committees when we were thinking about the rules we spent a great deal of time considering and although we appreciated that there is a move uh, amongst the judiciary to consider hearing the voice of the child directly, we determined at least at the outset that under Article 8.3 the, ar the arbitrator wouldn't meet or have any direct contact with the child. The way the arbitrator obtains the wishes and feelings of the child is vi by virtue of the appointment of an independent social worker. So we're envisaging independent social workers assisting arbitrators throughout um, the whole case. And we're also, it's incumbent when looking at arbitrator to think, uh, arbitrations, think about other forms of ADR. So referencing out into, for example, mediation, if the arbitrator sees that there's a blockage that may be um, sorted out by going to mediation or ENE, then it's incumbent on the arbitrator to propose that to the parties. One of the most anxious issues for children arbitrations has been safeguarding, and it's in the context of safeguarding that there's going to be a review of the rules and indeed of the referral form. Of course, where you have CAFCAS involvement in the court process, the Children Act provides for an offer, officer of the service to provide the court with a risk assessment and of course to order Section 7 or Section 37 reports. There's no such scheme in children arbitrations and therefore the rules provide by Article 17 that the parties are under a duty to provide some PNC basic checks. Um, for example, from Disclosure Scotland, which although it's Scotland, holds the same information as uh, the Disclosure and Barring Service in England and Wales. They produce the checks much more quickly. And prior to commencement and on an ongoing basis, there's a continuing duty to fully and completely disclose anything in a party's possession, control or knowledge which is or may be relevant to safeguarding the welfare of the child or indeed of the other party to the arbitration. And um, if there's an issue raised such as drug use, the arbitrator can direct expert evidence going to that issue. Uh, the, the parties or the arbitrator can also appoint an independent social worker to look specifically at safeguarding issues. Um, with the parties and with others who may be able to inform about those matters. And the rules also provide that if the arbitrator thinks there are reasonable grounds to believe that there may be a risk to um, either the party or the child, 
the arbitrator first can consider whether the arbitration can safely continue. Um, if not, um, he or she informs the parties in writing of that and of the reasons for it and terminates the arbitration. <coughs> and um, there are various other duties on the arbitrator, like many other professionals, that if during the course of the arbitration information <coughs> comes to the arbitrator which makes him or her aware of matters which cause him or her to reasonably apprehend, reasonably to apprehend that a child has suffered or is likely to suffer significant harm by reason of actual or likely future behaviour of either party, the arbitrator must communicate those concerns as soon as possible to the relevant agency, usually the local authority for the area in which the child is living. So uh, in arbitration, a uh, children arbitration, rather than talking about the arbitral award, we did we decided that it was preferable to talk about children in by way of determination rather than awarding children between the parents. So it's called the determination. It may be interim, partial, final, or by consent. The decision must be self-contained. So when we're teaching, we're suggesting that when somebody picks up a, a determination, they should be able to just work out exactly what's happened, the background of the case and all of the factual matrix, what's happened in the hearing and then the determination. It must state the applicable law, it must be signed by the arbitrator and crucially it is binding subject only to a uh, challenge by any arbitral process of appeal which would be uh, pursuant to the Arbitration Act or is it insofar as any court order is required any um, changes that the court would determine should be made. Costs in children arbitration are for either agreed <coughs> by the parties or determined by the arbitrator. Uh, the general principle set out in the rules is that there should be an equal mm -hmm. division but in the absence of an agreement between the parties, the arbitrator has a discretion. That might be regarded as being of benefit so that the arbitrator can reflect the way in which the parties um, conduct the arbitration, but also their financial means. What, what happens after you've got your determination? Well, if the subject matter of the determination makes it necessary, the parties are required to apply to the family court for an order in s the same or similar terms. Um, and the rules, as, as we've said, enshrine the no order principle, and that's why the parties must apply if it's, if it's thought that a court order is required. Uh, where a determination requires a party to give an undertaking, that determination can't take effect until the undertaking in written form has been lodged with the court and accepted um, and so there's a scheme there whereby we'll in invite the court to assist or the parties will refer it to court where necessary. So we're going to carry on by, in fact, in fact, conclude by talking about the benefits of arbitration, to drum that home to everyone, to make sure that everyone understands all of the positives. Um, first of all, the parties are selecting the decision maker uh, with obviously the advice of their solicitors and counsel, but we think that's pretty crucial. You know, you can determine who you think is the right person for the job. On the IFLA website, which by the way is a great resource and I would urge you to look at it, as I would familyarbitrator.com, both of them contain checklists for how you get engaged in an arbitration, what to do next, lots of frequently asked questions and answers. Um, but there, on the IFLA website, it sets up very clearly who the um, trained arbitrators are, C for children, F for financial, and FC means both. So you can easily find out for your uh, geographic region who is trained as an arbitrator. It, I think it's helpful in this context to have continuity of decision making as well. For those of us at the coal face, we know how deeply frust frustrating it is if cases aren't reserved and you, you have to explain to a client that it's a different judge to the judge you had last time, etc, etc. So I think that really is a selling point. Flexibility of approach, I think, is really crucial as well in terms of being able to determine with the arbitrator, the parties having a great deal of autonomy in the process, uh, determine how quickly or how slowly the pacing of the arbitration. It's a creative, tailor-made process. There are no set tracks. You don't have to do things. 
as it were, in, uh, in accordance with a, the, a court-imposed timetable. You can determine how you want to deal with the arbitration. And there's a possibility of a documents-only um, uh, outcome whereby you jointly instruct your arbitrator and then they, you ask the arbitrator to respond by way of a determination just by reading documents, no written evidence. So that's something else to consider. I think confidentiality is key, particularly if you're acting for celebrity clients who otherwise get very nervous about going into the court process. For me, that's been a real selling point. I've spoken to a number of clients who've wanted to engage in arbitration for that reason, if none of the others. Next, we have uh, His Honour Judge, uh, His Honour John Altman, forgive me. Uh, John, um, it will be a very familiar face for all of those who practice in London. He was, um, at the end of his career, senior designated family judge uh, for London. Um, he's returned sort of to practice, and we're delighted that he's uh, now a member of, of my chambers at 1KBW. And Will Tyler, Queen's Counsel, uh, is, again, a very familiar face to many. Uh, he's a specialist children's practitioner, both in public and in private work, and he is a qualified arbitrator. He's a recorder um, in the family court and also sits as a deputy high court judge in the family division. Now, they're going to tell us about the training experience and the relative uh, merits of arbitration compared to other uh, out-of-court dispute resolution uh, methods. Let's look for a few moments at the place taken by arbitration in the general scheme of things, in particular in relation to mediation and litigation, and I will deal with the two bullet points on your programme about that. Uh, does it really bring anything new to the panoply of ways in which family uh, disputes can be resolved? Why suddenly, at this moment in history, uh, are we beginning to look at children arbitration? Is it just a new way of dealing with it? Is it a way just of relieving the Treasury of some of the financial burden of uh, con providing for litigation in the courts? Or, or does it have something uh, more fundamental than that? Uh, what is someone who has spent their lives in the court system doing here, trumpeting the process of taking cases away from the courts? Well, there's one reason which I won't mention, but the other is that I fundamentally believe and have come to believe uh, that this particular process is suited to children arrangements in a way that it is suited to no other form of dispute, be it civil, international, or family, or of any other kind, and provides a way forward which opens a radical and very important door in the res resolution of these things. And I'll try and explain uh, why. There's nothing new about arbitration. It probably finds its origins in society itself when people got someone in the community to help them sort out a problem between themselves. Um, the first arbitration act in this country was as long ago as 1697. And that was an act of parliament that provided that arbitrations between merchants could be turned into a court order to assist in forcibility, uh, unless it was dealt with uh, dishonestly or corruptly. Uh, we haven't got done much more to the design of arbitration since then. Uh, so what's, why not then? What is it new about now, let's look just for a moment at the, uh, the, the real difference and a fundamental one at the court uh, process. The bar and solicitors over the years uh, in the family courts ha have performed miracles in uh, trying to relieve court proceedings of conflict and distress amongst the parties. Uh, they have combined a most remarkable, for me, feature of advocacy, which is the capacity to be united in seeking the welfare of the child, whilst at the same time fearlessly and forcefully representing their own clients. Uh, but in the very nature of litigation is conflict, is it not? One party takes the other to court. 
The second is immediately in a defensive position. There is conflict built into the system from that moment on. There's going to be a winner and there's going to be a loser. And the whole process gives rise to that. And the reason it's so fundamental in children cases is that unlike any other dispute, the court process is part of the facts of the family dispute. What happens in court, the way people act, what they say, what others says, is actually part and parcel of what the solution is and the capacity of the parties to implement it. It doesn't happen elsewhere. The definition of the burglary in the Crown Court isn't affected by what goes on in court. What's happened when a, 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 a snail has got into a bottle of ginger beer isn't affected by what happens in the county court. But it's only here that it does. And so the damage caused by the very litigation process is something that can be improved upon. And the fundamental, it seems to me, of arbitration is that the parties agree to go to arbitration. Immediately, the process is a cooperative one. And it insidiously introduces into the equation a degree of cooperation that develops as the case proceeds. For as has been pointed out, they then agree on the appointment of an arbitrator. They then agree on the process subject to the rules. They agree on the sort of arbitration they want, how uh, superficial, how brief, how complex they want. And most importantly of all, as the parties are led through this process, they come to be, agree to be bound by the determination. And when one thinks of the mindset of people embarking on there, there must then surely be a very likely slide into acceptance of the decision and cooperation in its implementation. And that, to me, is the fundamental that marks out children arbitration as opposed to anything else and makes it so important because it relieves the damage done by the litigation process from the resolution of children issues in a way that no other type of arbitration does. But if one thinks that one reads about the international uh, issues are settled by arbitration or an industrial dispute has gone to arbitration, don't we, as it were, breathe a sigh of relief and feel, well, then it's going to be decided, without talking of winners or losers, but only looking to what's going to be uh, the answer uh, at the end of the course. Uh, and that, those features of agreement, uh, I would suggest, are fundamentally important uh, with all the other processes uh, that are involved. And it's in this I would venture to suggest that advocacy is so important. Um, my conviction about this came about through the training, which uh, Will will say something about, if I'm permitted to say so, the, the very comfortable and thorough uh, training that was for me revelatory into the process that we are concerned with. Uh, but here is an area that needs advocacy. If there's to be planning, if there's to be cooperation as to what procedure there's going to be, what sort of hearing is going to be paper only, we're going to have a witness, can we get it done this week, shall we do it next week, how long should it go, can we do without that document? Here is a new arena for the advocate. And it seems to me we need advocates. And can I speak as someone who has sat listening to litigants in person? I can cope with litigants in person in court. I can talk to them. But there's a big gaping hole before we get there. There is nobody sitting in a solicitor's office sensitively taking a statement. There's no one uh, at a conference with counsel, 
going through all the remote issues. So the judge sits there and scratches his head and says, I don't actually know what I don't know in this case. And that's the danger. The uh, MOJ recently produced a chart of the length of time cases have taken, on average, depending on whether th there were two advocates or one advocate, one advocate on one side, one on the other. And for me, the glaring statistic was the one in which uh, it's shown that the shortest hearing are those where the applicant is represented and the respondent is in person. And that, to me, signals the inevitable conclusion that the case of the respondent uh, was considered more superficially than that of the applicant. Uh, and the importance of advocacy, uh, I plead, and as doors shut and advocates continue with the enthusiasm and commitment that uh, I, I'm amazed by but notice, uh, one hopes that this is an area uh, that can be achieved. Can I turn very briefly to uh, mediation for where uh, arbitration is, in my judgment, not only a substitution for the court process, but an advance and a step forward for the court process. It is a complement to mediation. Mediation is the gold standard, in, I would suggest, where, for, for two important reasons. Number one, it provides the opportunity and the occasion for the parties themselves to develop their own way of working out family problems that have to be a basis for the way they operate into the future. If it works, but only if some people can cope with it, but if they can and it works, it's wonderful. The second thing is this. In court, the court hearing is a snapshot at a point in time. What's to happen in the future is often, dare I say, a form of guesswork built on that one occasion. The mediation process, as I've come to learn quite recently and realise, is actually an organic process during the period that the mediations carry on, in which the parties themselves develop a process of understanding and activity which can become a sound factual basis for long-term decisions rather than judgment as to the future based on a court proceeding. And of course, uh, so the arbitration could come along to decide a relocation issue within the United Kingdom uh, uh, to be followed by mediation as to all the arrangements that are to be made. Uh, if there's... Um, if it, if it can't be, if the initial decision can't be decided at the end, towards the end of a mediation, where there's a, a, a single issue blocking uh, completion, as the president pointed out uh, before, uh, called MEDARB. I was billed, and I've uh, got less than half a minute to deal with it, with safeguarding issues to talk to you about, so I'm highly delighted <laughs> that Suzanne has already dealt with them to an extent. But I would only say this, uh, I uh, remember and refer back to whenever I can, at REL in 2000 in the volume two of the FLR, in which for the, uniquely the Court of Appeal heard expert witnesses and which drew to attention of practitioners that this is an incredibly important area that must be resolved. And I would commend to anyone the approach in the absence of being able to get enhanced um, criminal record checks, the approach adopted by mediators who have uh, guidelines and training in this field in the way in which to approach this important issue. Uh, and whilst the default position of the rules is that arbitrators must respond to information they get and decide what to do about it in relation to safeguarding. Uh, may I invite consideration in addition to a proactive process of inquiry and investigation at the start of any arbitration, whilst that's not spelled out 
it must surely be in the interests of those arbitrations that aren't black and white, is it so serious that we can't proceed, to those cases where discord between parties which would come under this category must influence the determination and the real nature of what should happen. Uh, so uh, may I suggest that after a long history of arbitration, children arbitration is something whose time has come and can provide a lot of answers to our problems. The training experience. It's um, slightly awkward sharing a platform with my two schoolmistresses, having to recount to you what a miserable weekend I spent in April this year. Stuck for most of it in the corner with a dunce's hat planted firmly uh, on my head. Uh, I couldn't recommend the course actually highly enough to you. It is, as you've heard, a two-day re non-residential course in London. It is informative. It is packed with information. Uh, it is replete with very thoughtful exercises, uh, both in judgecraft and in learning about arbitration. Perhaps most importantly, it is a very convivial weekend. The atmosphere is, I think, deliberately a collegiate one. Uh, and it's that informality, the good fun we all had, uh, coupled with the hard work, which left all of us, I think, leaving that we fully understood the scheme uh, and our part in it, but you would expect that. Uh, but also having all of us thought rather more carefully than we would have done on our own if it were less discursive about the potential pitfalls, the challenges, uh, the opportunities, uh, how to make sure the parties got the most uh, out of the uh, arbitral process. I was going to warn anyone thinking about the course uh, to make sure they leave space in their diary to complete their determination writing. You are strictly told you have a week in which to do so. You'll leave the course with a spring in your step. You'll leave it uh, fully converted uh, to the benefits of the scheme. Uh, the only word of warning possibly is this. It's £1,600 plus VAT. That is not very much if you quickly secure uh, a decent uh, handful of arbitrations. Uh, if you don't, then it's quite a hit to take. So a degree of real realism, I suppose, is needed as to whether you are going to be one of the people that finds themselves on uh, litigants or solicitors' lists of appropriate arbitrators. So how does the scheme work in practice? The beauty of the scheme, uh, as attested to by everyone who's spoken so far, is its flexibility. Uh, flexibility in relation to what you litigate. Is it the whole dispute that's up for grabs? Is it a particular question? Uh, flexibility in that you choose your timescales, you even choose your own procedure. As part of the flexibility, where appropriate, there is an enhanced informality. Uh, informality as to litigation procedure, uh, as well, where appropriate, uh, as to court etiquette. Now, there's been, so far, one single children arbitration. Uh, so when I run through the way in which the scheme uh, is going to work, uh, I draw, of course, on that, but more uh, largely on the financial uh, arbitrations that have taken place. Uh, so step one uh, is to choose your arbitrator. Even that is a uh, flexible process. The parties can agree their arbitrator from the list. They can choose the person they both think will best be suited to the clients, the dispute, the subject matter, the technical issues, whatever it happens to be. Uh, given, though, the inbuilt mistrust and scepticism uh, which may uh, inject even the arbitral process, uh, there are other ways to do it in the same way as we choose single joint experts. Uh, one side can compile a list of half a dozen, the other can uh, choose three off that list with any of whom they'd be happy. Uh, the last, uh, the other party can, can choose one of those. Uh, or IFLA will uh, choose from a shortlist if you ask them to. Or IFLA will appoint an arbitrator uh, from their entire list simply based on your criteria. Uh, either way, you end up with an arbitrator uh, to whom you submit, as you've heard, your ARB1CS form. Now, at the point that the arbitrator formally accepts the appointment, the arbitral process begins. Uh, at that point, possibly beforehand, possibly afterwards, uh, it may be useful, it may be appropriate to have a preliminary meeting 
uh, one hazards to guess that will probably be by telephone in the first instance. Many financial arbitrators offer that service free of charge on a no commitment basis. Uh, presumably, children arbitrators will follow suit. Uh, the function of that meeting is largely for the arbitrator to content him or herself that the dispute is appropriate for arbitration. Uh, there will almost certainly be a case management conference. Uh, depending on the dispute, nature, subject matter, geography, uh, that may be in person, it may be by video, it may be by phone, it may be with or without lay clients. Uh, it may be that directions are largely agreed by the parties, or it may be that the arbitrator has to impose them. So much like similar hearings uh, in the court process, except for the fact that it will start when it's supposed to start. You won't have to wait for three hours in the dreadful waiting room of the central family court. <laughs> Um, and the judge will be pleased to see you because you are personally paying him. <laughs> At that meeting, there will be decisions made uh, about the procedure to be adopted. Will it be live evidence? Will it be oral submissions only? Will it be paper? You know, why not for a straightforward uh, specific issue order? Can it not be determined simply on paper, as many uh, financial arbitrations are? Will there be an expert? Uh, if so, who? Uh, will there be an ISW? What will he or she be asked to do? But other things, procedure, will strict rules of evidence apply? Uh, or will you agree with the arbitrator to disapply, for example, the strict rule uh, that one has to challenge uh, in cross-examination, all facts not agreed between the parties? Directions about filing of evidence, whether a further hearing's needed, and possibly matters of disclosure may come up. Uh, it's beyond the scope of this short talk, uh, but there may be a need at that stage to seek help uh, from the court by way of specific orders about witnesses, disclosure, etc. Uh, there may be a further directions hearing, uh, there may not, it depends of course on the dispute. Uh, the next stage is simply this, the directions are complied with and then the arbitration takes place. Uh, it may uh, be the case, we'll see what happens in practice, that most arbitrations are concluded within a day, uh, of course they could be more, they could be less. What's the procedure at the arbitration? Well. That's the point, isn't it? Who knows? It's up to you and the arbitrator. It will almost certainly be a less formal procedure than the court. It could be a room in chambers. It could be in a solicitor's office. It could be a hired room. Uh, there can be breakout rooms if needed. It can be in the broom cupboard if it really uh, is the agreed position of the parties, that that's where it should take place. Uh, the hearing itself, uh, the, the, the way in which the room is set out uh, may be informal, it might look like a DJ's appointment, um, or you might have the sort of case that requires a rather more formal, more court-like structure and layout. Uh, but the arbitration takes place in whatever way, in whatever place, with whatever procedure you determine, uh, and then the next stage is the determination. Uh, now, again, the determination is uh, intricately linked with the payment of costs of the arbitrator. Uh, so you may find that reserved judgments happen rather less. Uh, the expectation will be that within a week of the arbitration, uh, you will have your determination. And the final stage, only if needed, uh, is uh, that a consent order is then submitted to the court, uh, together with a copy of the determination. Uh, you've heard about one of the advantages being the confidentiality of this system. There's a procedure in place for the determination to be given in a sealed envelope to be opened <coughs> only uh, on the direction of a family court judge. So in that sensitive case, uh, that confidentiality uh, is assured. Now I told you that there has been one arbitration uh, under the Children's Scheme so far. You may have read about it in Family Law Week. Farouk Ahmed and Julie Stather wrote it up. Uh, one of them was the arbitrator. Very briefly, the facts, or at least the time scale, was that we don't know the facts because it's strictly confidential, but a court application was made on the 17th of March. It took five months to get up to the DRA, so usual uh, sort of uh, time scales, uh, that being in August. The parties needed in August a really, really quick decision within two weeks. Uh, you can guess the dispute was probably about schooling or something similar. Uh, they were offered their court date three, week, uh, three months after the date, rendering it, of course, completely pointless. Uh, so on the 19th of August, they appointed an arbitrator. That arbitrator heard the case on the 26th of August. The determination was sent to the parties on the 29th of August, so within 10 days of his or her being appointed, uh, they knew uh, exactly what it was that had been decided. 
And that's perhaps the sort of dispute that will so often lend itself to arbitration. The parties aren't at daggers drawn, but they need a decision. Uh, they'll both be bound by it, but they need someone to decide for them. Uh, and very quickly, uh, the parties in that case uh, have their decisions. Uh, we expect uh, it will depend on the facts of the case, it will depend uh, on the need for evidence, on expert instruction and the like, but we expect that it's not unreasonable to expect resolution of most uh, children arbitration cases uh, from beginning to end within a matter of a few months at most, even when ISW uh, or other expert reports are needed. Uh, and uh, compare that with the sort of timescale uh, we so often see, uh, sadly, when litigating in private law uh, in the court system. Finally, this, one of the topics I was asked to look at is arbitration and direct access. Uh, point number one, there's no reason at all why a direct access client and his or her counsel uh, shouldn't take advantage of the scheme. In fact, if you think about the source of clients who often are attracted to direct public access, stripping out the sometimes unnecessary and expensive and time-consuming parts of litigation, uh, they may well be very attracted uh, to this uh, particular scheme. Uh, and secondly, there's no reason why uh, lay parties themselves can't refer themselves to arbitration. Uh, I think it's the case that Karen has arbitrated one such scheme, uh, one such arbitration, uh, which may be a convenient moment for me to hand over to her. Um, Karen Walker is the chair of Resolution Dispute Resolution Committee. We're very pleased indeed that she has been able to join us um, this evening. Uh, she has a, a great deal of experience in all areas of family law, both uh, finance and children, and has a particular um, talent for reducing costs and acrimony in the cases that she deals with. So Karen is going to talk to us about choosing your arbitrator and what sort of disputes might be referred off to arbitration. So, um, over the last couple of years, I've done quite a few talks, um, principally to solicitors, um, but sometimes to barristers as well, about um, the arbitration process, its merits, um, and the process itself, and so on. And it's always extremely well received. Um, and then um, people will say, oh, but there are only certain cases that you can refer to arbitration. Um, and what makes a case suitable, as though arbitration is the alternative and definitely not the norm. Um, as Suzanne and Janet have um, explained, there have been a, a relatively small number still of cases that have gone to arbitration within the financial process, um, and thus far only one that has been referred in the, in the children process. Um, and I'm asked to, to talk to you about what sort of disputes ought to be referred into arbitration, but I'd rather say to you, um, why would you not refer a dispute into arbitration? What would um, make it such that you would go through the misery of the court process if there was something different that you could do? Um, Suzanne and Janet have given you the specific examples of those cases which are unsuitable and clearly um, they're self-explanatory. I think that if you had a case where safeguarding issues are really giving you cause for concern, um, that's something that you um, would refer into court. But otherwise, um, in any situation where parents have issues over child arrangements or otherwise, um, why would you not refer into a process that is private, convenient, without delay, dealt with by one person who's going to be committed to dealing with that family and helping them um, reach a, a decision in that situation in a time effective, cost effective fashion? Why on earth would you not do that? Um, and so. I think that it's, it's not about what is suitable, but what are the few cases that are unsuitable and why in all other circumstances would you not give your clients the best possible service um, that they would be entitled to. Um, now, to my mind, there are two major impediments to arbitration progressing in the way in which um, the government and the judiciary might hope. Um, the cynical side of me is going to say to you that lawyers make less money, um, and I say that quite openly, because I think that's one of the biggest problems to it. Um, the second, and perhaps the more practical reason, is that lawyers don't yet really feel comfortable dealing with the process. Um, we've all been issuing Forms A and Form C100 for as long as we can think. Um, it's a process that we feel very comfortable with. Um, 
and and we know that we're going to be as equally competent as the other practitioner involved in dealing with the situation. So why would we put ourselves in in a circumstance where we are embarking on a form of C something that we've never seen before? We're not entirely sure how to fill in, um, and then engage in this very flexible, slightly uncertain process that doesn't follow the tram lines that we've always been used to, and possibly disadvantage ourselves and therefore our client. Well, the simple answer is that the rules are very, very straightforward um, and very clear. And if you familiar, familiarise yourselves with the Arbitration Act and the IFLA rules, um, all of which are readily available on the website, that's all you need to know. Um, so far as clients are concerned, um, they really like the process. And actually, in my own practice, um, I've recently had some strange examples of, of clients ringing me to say, oh, you offer arbitration because we have an arbitration website. It's something we're really interested in. We'd like a decision fairly quickly. Is that something you can do? Um, so you have a, a very sort of short conversation. They go back to their lawyers. Um, and then they come back and say, no, my solicitor says this isn't suitable. And you think, oh, OK. <laughs> um, and. I think it's because it's this lack of familiarity. Now, we live in a world of changing practices without doubt. Family law is changing beyond recognition in front of our eyes. Um, and as has been identified by one of the previous speakers, if we don't keep up with that, people are going to step in and take the work away from us. Um, I was thinking, following the DR conference in Nottingham a couple of weeks ago, um, why it is that statistically fewer people are now taking up legal advice um, in circumstances where they're separating. And I think the part of that is because couples who are separating now are very much more likely to be the children of couples who separated 20 and 30 years ago. They remember hideous child arrangements, access, custody, and goodness knows what else. Um, they also remember hideous cost for their parents and real repercussions which dramatically affected them in their own childhood. And actually, why would they want to go anywhere near a process that is going to replicate that for themselves and their children? And I think it's up to us as practitioners mm -hmm. to demonstrate that actually there is a far better process that they can engage in, that they don't have to use the court. Um, children, when, they, when their parents go to court, are inevitably aware that that's what they're doing, that mum and dad can't make decisions about us for themselves. So they're going to a court environment, very Kramer versus Kramer, for those of you that are old enough as I am to remember that, um, in that sort of very sort of television drama kind of situation. Um, because that's their only experience of court. Um, now, that can't be a good thing for a child um, who's having to deal with the difficulties of their parents' separation in any event. Arbitration is an agreed process. It's taking a step where you've tried to sort things out yourselves. That hasn't been possible. You need somebody to make a decision. And so you jointly invite that person to do that. Um, by agreement, working constructively, okay to have somebody else to make the decision, but then to move forwards in your family environment um, without the delay-ridden, cost-ridden, hideous process that goes with it. The judiciary at present can't deal properly with the cases that come in front of them. That's bad enough with money, but it's absolutely <coughs> critical so far as children are concerned. Um, I had the misfortune of being in the family court at Guildford yesterday for the final day of a three-day Children Act application. No way on earth would the other side have agreed to, to arbitrate this, sadly. Um, we were listed for an hour, it was for the cost element of our hearing. It was never going to take an hour. Um, so we went in at 10, we came out at 12, and we had to go back in at 12.30. We came out again, went back in at quarter to two. Each time we came out, we lost our um, consultation room that we'd had, so we ended up perched on suitcases in corridors. Um, completely unsatisfactory. The judge who'd heard our case in August couldn't actually remember whether there were three children or two, which was not his fault because you know, he was juggling, juggling matters um, as, as it stood, but wholly unsatisfactory for the client. Um, when you're arbitrating, you have a situation where you're being paid to do it. So you're doing a very different job. You're working for and with the couple. You're creating flexible arrangements that will work to their time scale to give the best possible service within which matters can be resolved. And for me, it's an absolute no-brainer um, that that is the way to, to move forwards. Um, 
I've been asked to talk about engaging the client and the misconceptions. Actually, for the client, I think there are no misconceptions. At the end of the day, clients do what they're advised to do, I think. Um, if they select a professional to help them in a situation, they are going to follow the recommendation that that professional gives. You know, they don't really know the difference between mediation, arbitration, court, collaborative law or what. Um, so it's your guidance. I think if you are seeing clients in conference um, and your recommending process, recommend arbitration. The sheer speed of it has to be better to resolve their disputes. Um, I do think that the process lends itself to direct access advocacy. I also think that um, to have advocacy within the process is far better. Um, we'll refer to the fact, <coughs> excuse me, um, that I, that my very first um, arbitration on, on the financial side involved an unrepresented couple um, whose solicitors had felt that the process wasn't for them, but they resolutely persevered um, and, and, and came through and dealt with it. Um, to a very satisfactory conclusion, very sweetly, they both emailed me afterwards to say that notwithstanding the fact that they were poles apart, um, they really respected the decision, which was very rewarding, the whole thing a bit scary as it was my first experience, um, but very rewarding at the end. Um, and I think that if, as a profession, we don't um, pick up the arbitration mantle and take it forwards, um, either other people will in our place or the public will start to approach arbitrators themselves because actually there's no reason why they shouldn't. Yet the presentation of their case um, is never going to be uh, as well articulated um, and that therefore puts them at a disadvantage. So I would urge you to recommend it um, as a process um, for the benefit of your clients. I mentioned earlier about the cost point. Yes, I think it is cheaper. Um, it's sold as being more expensive because you've got to pay the arbitrator. <laughs> Um, but what you save in, what was it, unattractive routine stuff that our solicitors do in the background <laughs> that we'll mention, but what you save in, in that endless paperwork and the fact that a case that operates on a taxi meter basis has a drip feed of fees that takes on a life of its own during the six, ten, however many months that evolve between, between court hearings. And that's, that's the saving that can be made. I think much more particularly the saving just in one's sanity and life that you get X months of your life back because you're not embroiled in a process that's unnecessary. And think of the impact that that always has on the children. They've got two parents whose half their brain is thinking about the court process and the cost and everything else that's involved with that when they should be parenting their children and enabling them to get on with their lives. Um, Finally, what is one looking for in an arbitrator? Um, there are lots of different types of arbitrators, um, from judges to QCs to barristers to solicitors. Um, and just as, as a solicitor, one chooses counsel and generally has a group of barristers to whom one would refer work on a regular basis, um, I think that exactly the same ought to build up so far as arbitrators are concerned. You're going to choose your arbitrator that best suits your client and best suits your case. So if the issues are extremely complex or um, focus on a particular area of the law, then you're going to research the individuals who have experience of, of, of that area of dispute. If it's absolutely standard, and Christmas falls at the weekend this year, so I have no doubt that there are going to be problems over whose week weekend it is and whether it should be split or not. Um, that sort of issue, which is very straightforward, can be dealt with really by any competent arbitrator who you feel that your couple would work well with. One of the things that I found um, as an arbitrator is that you do build up a rapport with the couple um, and you have the opportunity um, where if issues arise in terms of timing or directions um, or something's going to be a couple of days late, um, that they can email you. Um, and it, it makes you feel very involved both in, in the matter itself and the outcome, which I think also is to the benefit of the client. So um, Will's already taken you through the, the various mechanisms for selecting an arbitrator, but build up um, a, 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 an identifiable group of people that you feel could deal with certain areas of the work that you do and refer to them. Um, at the end of the day on the cost side, um, we, are, we work on an hourly basis. As long as you're working for the right number of hours a day, it doesn't matter whether you're dealing with 10 cases that are going to spend nine months in court or 60 cases that are going to spend 
three months in arbitration. Um, I think it's a process that the public already really warm to. Um, and I think that as professionals, we ought to be at the front of front end of that and leading the field and ensuring that it is something that we're recommending to our clients so that we don't allow others to slip in um, and take advantage of that change. Thank you.